We're going to do a little bit of a series, kind of two messages from a longer series. It's about not taking offense, so no offense. Um, I know that if someone starts a conversation with me that says, hey, Chris, no offense, but, you know, it's like, then I know I'm going to get offended. Like, I know it's going to be an offensive thing. It's like, no offense, but really it's someone just saying, I'm about to, you know, tell you something offensive. But, but what we're going to focus on today is something that we all deal with. And it's actually a big thing that we deal with. Uh, it's something that really hampers who we are and it, and it kind of, um, you know, eats at our heart and eats at our soul a little bit. And, and it's this topic of bitterness. And today we're going to be answering the question of what do we do when bitterness takes over? So, so this, this, is, this is where we're headed today. So if you feel like you are a bitter person, so what is bitterness? You know, it, it's not eating lemons or limes or, or things like that. Bitterness is a position in your heart where uh, you, you, you feel almost resentment or anger towards somebody. Bitterness is something that, that you maybe don't even know what's happening to you. And, and you know when you're feeling bitter about a situation or about a person because when you get in that situation or around that person, all of a sudden you start to feel different, you know, and, and you become overly sensitive. I like to think of bitterness kind of like a, a sunburn. So if you go out and you go to the beach and you get sunburned, then the, maybe the next day, even before you go out in the sun, maybe you sit at your kitchen table and the sun comes in through the window and that sun hits your sunburn and it's like, ooh, that already feels hot. Bitterness is kind of that way. It's like, it's like a sunburn for your soul. And it doesn't take a lot to make that flare up and to make that burn feel even hotter. So I've got a good definition, a good way of kind of putting bitterness in perspective for you. And it comes from, from a Psychology Today magazine. And it, it's a quote here that I'll read you. And I, I'm not super smart, so I had to read it a couple times to understand it. I'll make sure we all get this. All bitterness starts out as hurt. Okay, we can agree with that. Bitterness begins with hurt. And your emotional pain, so the pain you feel emotionally, may well relate to viewing whoever or whatever provoked this hurt as having malicious intent. So your pain and your hurt is because you're looking at somebody or something that, has had, that you feel like has been malicious towards you. And, and it's as committing a grave injustice towards you, as gratuitously wronging you and causing you grief. And then the quote goes on, and it says, Anger and resentment is what we're all likely to experience whenever we conclude that another has seriously abused us. Left us to fester, that righteous anger eventually becomes the corrosive ulcer that is bitterness. Now, I feel like this kind of puts it quite well, that bitterness is something that is kind of a journey. It starts with maybe something that happens that you get hurt uh, by somebody through a situation that makes you angry. It makes you feel, feel hurt, and then that makes it easier for you to get hurt again. It makes it easier for your anger to grow. And when you leave that, when you don't deal with that, when you just say, ah, oh, you know what, it's not worth it. Or, you know, I'm not going to approach this or, or deal with that. Like, I'm, I'm just going to let it go. I'm just... I'm just going to let it go. You know, some people are, are that way where you just, it's easy for you to let things go. I'm not that way. I'm super confrontational. And so I, I will just, just deal with it. But what happens is, is just like it says, it, it forms, I don't know if anyone's had an ulcer. See, I've, I've had stomach ulcers before, and it feels like somebody's lit a fire inside your stomach, and it's going to just explode throughout you. And, and bitterness does that. That, that's what bitterness is. Now, I know that this is a very sensitive subject for us. Because by me talking about bitterness, I'm asking you to access a place where somebody has hurt you. I'm asking you to access a place where you're angry. I'm asking you to dig deep and access feelings and thoughts that you would rather suppress and push down. Things that you don't want to deal with. Now, also, I'm a pro at this. I'm great at suppressing things. There's years worth of stuff that I've not dealt with because it's just easier to just cram it down in there, you know? And every now and again, it leaks out, and that's a bad thing. So I don't want you to be like me. I know that this is sensitive. So I, I, want, I want you to know this, that before the service, every Sunday, 
we have a prayer team that meets. And we believe in prayer here. This is church. We're not afraid to say that we believe in prayer and the miracle of prayer. And so every Sunday morning before the service starts, our prayer team meets and they pray over the service. So before you decide that you don't want to deal with your bitterness, before you decide that it's too much for you to take on this morning, before you decide that you'd rather to just check out and just get through the rest of this message and go on about your day, because it's so sensitive, I want you to know that you've been prayed over, and I want you to know that this is a safe space for you to kind of open up these things in your heart. Now, I know that no one started out this morning and got dressed and said, I can't wait to come to church today and deal with all my past hurts. <laughs> this is going to be a great day, you know, a smiley face, strong arm, and you know, chocolate pudding. <laughs> it's like... Man, today's going to be a great Sunday. But I want you to know that I woke up this morning and I thought, you know what? I can't wait to go and talk about bitterness because I believe that people are going to be set free from it today. I believe that people are going to be able to let go of some of it. I believe that if you can walk out of here and have a little bit of a lighter load taken off of your shoulders, that's a really good thing for you. See, I, I think that, that although you may on your side think, well, why on earth are we doing this? Can we talk about like, happy things and good things? And, and yes, you know what? This is a happy and a good thing. And the reason it's a happy and a good thing is because of bitterness. If bitterness has you in a prison, then I know the one who has the key to your cell. So if you feel like your bitterness has got you stuck somewhere, then today we're going we're gonna to unlock the cell. I'm going to give you that key. Now you get to make the decision. Do I want to put the key in and turn it and open the door and walk out? Or do I want to put the key in the back pocket and deal with it later? Or do I just not want to accept it at all? And so my hope and prayer is for you is that we all use this key to get out of our cell today. So I want to introduce to you our key scripture today. So this, is, this scripture is, is kind of the, the, the key that I'm talking about, or one of the keys to it. And it's in Hebrews chapter 12. And Hebrews is a book in the New Testament of the Bible. And this book was written to kind of the, 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 the Jewish Christians. So these are Jews that had converted over to Christianity. And the author, you know, it's kind of debated. It's unknown who the author is. But we know who he was writing to, and we know why he was writing See, as he's writing to, to people, it, it's, they, they're a group of Christians that have been persecuted. They've largely been left. They've largely been abandoned. These are people that, that are, are feeling maybe a little bit bitter. People that are feeling a little bit disenchanted by their situation. So even though this is in the Bible and this is a long time ago, I just want you to know that the words that are written on this screen or that we're going to read today, they do apply to your life. In fact, these people, I would say, had it even worse than a lot of us have it. And so these words apply to them, and they apply to your life. There's nothing that you have in your life that this cannot apply to. And so let, let's read here. In, in verse 14, Hebrews chapter 12, 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace. So already I'm mad. Make every effort to live in peace. Right? It's like, well... Okay, first we could just work on that one, Chris. So make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. So that means no cussing. With holiness, no one will see the Lord. Or without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. So there's a responsibility that we have. And that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So what this verse is giving us, this verse is giving us uh, an instruction to make every effort. But this verse is also giving us kind of a consequence. It's giving us um, a reason as to why we want to do that, as to why we want to make these efforts. And we're going to jump into this verse more and kind of pull it apart and see how it applies to our life. But kind of what we're going to do today and what we're about to do is see the, the realities of, of bitterness... There, there are these realities of bitterness that we have to look at. These are things that, that we can't avoid. These are things that impact us and we can't get away from them. So you need to know that whether you want to deal with your bitterness or not, there are realities to the bitterness that you carry. And then we're going to talk about how to kill it. We're, we're going to tell you 
how to get rid of that bitterness that you carry. So let's look at the first reality. The first reality of bitterness is this. Bitterness is a hidden destroyer. Now, this is so important because a lot of us don't even know when we feel bitter. We don't know when we feel like someone's offended us or when we're hurt. It's like all of a sudden, we just carry around a little bit of bitterness. Well, what I like about this, what I love about the way the Bible has, has handled this, is because bitterness is a hidden destroyer, I want to kind of do a little bit of an illustration for you. Remember the verse that we just read? It talked about a bitter root. And so it said part of that verse was that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. So what about roots and root systems? If you imagine a tree, a root system is under the ground. You can't see it. And that root system plays a role in keeping the tree alive or it plays a role in maybe the tree dying. But that root system is, is down there and it's working and it's spreading out. And as the tree grows, that root system, it grows and it grows and it grows. You know, the weeds in your yard are the same way. Those, those weeds, they, they, the little roots grow. We have a, maybe some of, maybe Alan, you know this. There's a weed in our yard that if you pull, it's like pulling a string. It's like a, a kilometer long. It just keeps pulling up out of the, the grass all the way around. And I one day started pulling these, these weeds out. And, it, you know, half the yard's now gone. <laughs> but the whole thing is rooted into... The grass, you have shallow roots, you have deep roots, but you don't really know what you're, what you're getting with the root until you start to dig it up or until you start to look at it or you start to deal with it. And so now if we take that and we apply that to our lives, our lives, we have roots that are in us that are beneath the surface that we don't know. We don't necessarily know what's happening until we dig in there and we deal with it. So if you're a suppressor like me, then you don't really know what's happening until you start to open up and talk about these emotions or these feelings or this bitterness that you have. And in fact, I, I, I like taking the, the, the root system kind of example even further to say that, that roots and trees and stuff and plants, they start as seeds. Well, the experiences that your life goes through, your life experiences plant seeds. And then those seeds take root in your heart. So imagine... That as life happens to you, it's little seeds that are being planted. The music you listen to, seeds that are being planted. The way that your family raised you, seeds that are being planted. Maybe the abuse that you received or maybe the extra love that you received from your family. All those things that happen, the job interviews, the breakups, the moves, all those things that happen. Those life experiences, they're planting seeds. And as those seeds take, take root in you, those roots start to spread in and throughout you. And so what we have to do is we have to tend our garden. We've got to take a look at what seeds are being planted. We've got to pull out the bad roots, and then we can leave in the good roots. Now, if you're curious as to how do you know what, what to pull out or what, what, to, what to leave in, I'll tell you, I worked for a landscaping company for a little while, and I wasn't doing... Um, I, Eventually, I was not allowed to touch any plants because I, I, they would say, hey, go pull the weeds, you know, in this flower bed. I just pull everything out, you know. And people would say, well, I would get in trouble. They'd say, why did you pull the plants out? Now we've got to buy all these new plants. So well, I don't know what the difference is between a weed and, you know, between a plant. And eventually they took away that and I, I, lost, I lost all plant duty. So in your life, here's how you tell. So if you look at the fruit that's growing out of you, that will point to what is taking root in you. So let me, let me say that again, because we need to examine our lives with this. If you look at the fruit that's going out of you, is it love, is it peace, is it joy, is it kindness? Or is it anger, is it resentment, is it bitterness, is it fear, is it frustration? Whatever's coming out of you, is coming out of you because it's taken root in you. And this is why we have to tend our gardens. This is why we have to take care of what seeds get planted and what seeds we leave. Because those seeds take root. And we have to examine our lives and take a look at what's coming out so that we know, okay, am I putting good stuff in here? 
And then if you want to take it even further, you could, take, uh, you could fertilize the good stuff, and that's just the Bible and prayer and worship and all that stuff, but we won't go there today. But the, the second reality of bitterness that I want to talk to you about is, is that your bitterness will hurt many people. So if we look at the verse again, we go back to Hebrews 12, 15. It says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See, bitterness is not a solo sport. It's not something that we do on our own. It's not something that we carry on our own. You know that when a bitter person walks into a room, it, it's, almost, it's like a cancer. It, it's like a, yeah, it just spreads throughout the room. And it spreads to other people. And if you're carrying a lot of bitterness in your heart, then I promise you, your family's being impacted by it. Your significant other's being impacted by it. You are being impacted by it. Your relationship with yourself is being impacted by it. Bitterness is not something that we can just carry around or that we can ignore. It's not something that we can just say, well, you know, I'm just going to keep this hidden in me. I'm going to put on a happy face. And I'm going to walk into work, or I'm going to walk into my my family's Sunday dinner. I'm going to walk into this party or hanging out with my friends. I'm going to put on a happy face, and I'm just going to smile, and I'm going to get through it, and everything's going to be wonderful, and people are going to say, how are you doing? Oh, I'm lovely. You look amazing. No, you look amazing. And all this is happening. And then when you leave, it all crumbles. And you're only going to be able to do that for so long. And then guess what's going to happen? The facade that you put up is going to crack. And you're going to find yourself in a situation, specifically in a situation where you're maybe alone and somebody else comes up next to you and they're like, hey, what do you think about so-and-so? Or, hey, what's going on here with this? And then in you, that bitterness, it's like opening the floodgates. And you just start talking. You start talking, oh, well, this person hurt me. And can you believe they did this? And you know what? They're horrible at the way they handle this. Or I can't believe they, you know, and you just trash that person. And so now you've brought another person into your bitterness. See, the verse says is that it will defile many people. Now, the Greek word for defile that it's talking about is to stain or pollute what's interesting about that is when you stain something, it's really hard to get it clean. When you pollute something, it's really hard to get it clean. I grew up doing a lot of backpacking and hiking and doing multi-day hikes in the, in the woods in Tennessee. And the water is not super safe to drink because the animals also use the water to do their business in it. So you can pick up things like worms and all kinds of other fun stuff. And so the water is polluted. Now, there is a way to clean the water so that you can drink it, but it is a process. You can either boil it for 8 to 12 minutes to clean it, or there's all kinds of different water filtration devices that you can use that will clean the pollutants out of the water. But it's not an easy process. See, stain is the same thing. For some reason, every other shirt that I own has a stain right here, and I don't know why. I don't know if it's the way I cook eggs or what. But I put things on and I'm like, there it is. And I can't figure out where it comes from. But it's really hard to get that stain out. It is. And see, when we drag other people into our bitterness, we stain them. We pollute them. Our bitterness stains them and pollutes them. And yes, it's not permanent. That stain and that pollutant can be pulled out of them. But it takes a lot of effort. See, the amount of damage you do is not equal to, well, let me put it to you this way. The effort it takes for you to to do damage is significantly, significantly less than the effort it takes for someone to be cleaned or unstained or unpolluted. So we walk around, and when we carry our bitterness, we just defile, and we just hurt people. And see, when we invite, this is a truth I want you to know. When we invite people into our bitterness, we become the stumbling block for their pursuit of peace for others. See, we don't want to be a stumbling block for peace. You know, if you feel like you're struggling with bitterness, I know that, that if you paused and you took a step back, you would probably do anything in the world that you could do to just find peace. Now, why would, 
Why would we want to be a stumbling block so that others also can't find peace? We, it doesn't make sense, but we do. We bring people in, we become a stumbling block for them. We take away their peace. Now all of a sudden, you've tainted somebody else's idea of another person or situation. And now, now there's two of you without peace. And you can probably go get a third and a fourth and a fifth. And before you know it, you've got just a mad group of people. They're all bitter at the same thing. And so I want to make sure that we don't stay there. I want to give us a way out of this. And so we're going to talk about three ways that we can kill bitterness. These are three things that you can do to kill a root of bitterness. And, and these are not easy things. These are kind of hard things. But there are three very important things that you can do. So the first thing that you can do is you can expose the object of your bitterness. You can expose it. This means that, that you can talk about it. You can get it out there. You, you, can, you can bring it out of the dark, bring it out of the shadows of your heart. So all of you out there, all of you, including me, that have something that you're bitter about or a person, and you've got it tucked away in your safe space, and you like to pull it out, especially, I don't know if anyone's had arguments in the shower where you always win, you know? That's where that bitterness comes out, where you're like, I'm going to, you know, and you're watching your hair all mad, and, you know, that, that's, that, that thing that's in you there, we've got to expose that. And so I'll, I'll give you the verse, just so that you know this isn't my idea. I want you to know this comes from the Bible. So we'll look in Ephesians 5.11, and this is Paul talking. He's talking to the church of Ephesus, and he says, Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So let me kind of demystify this. What is a fruitless deed of darkness? That could be talking about somebody negatively. That could be taking your bitterness to somebody else and being a stumbling block for their peace. You know, that, that's what he means by, by fruitless deeds of darkness. And there's others in there, like having lustful thoughts or, or you know, all, all of that stuff. Anything that's not edifying to God is, is, a, fruitless, is a fruitless deed of darkness. And so Paul says, hey, don't. Don't have anything to do with it. Rather, expose it. So we, we've got to talk about it. We've got to get your bitterness out there. And here's another truth. Here's, this is a very hard one here. Is, is this. You cannot heal from something that you cannot admit. Yeah, just take a deep breath on that one. Because you know what it means when you admit something. In order to admit something, you've got to humble yourself. In order to admit and expose something you feel bitter about, you've got to say, oh man, I need to swallow a big pill of humility and admit that I'm bitter over this, which means that I'm admitting that I want to let this go, which means that I'm admitting it's not something that I want to carry around. And that, that's hard to do. Now, the second step for us is that you've got to cancel their debt. So whatever happened to you that made you bitter... You've got to cancel the debt. You've got to let it go. You've got to say, you know what? I'm just going to let this go. I, I've got a verse for you, and, and we're not going to put it on the screen. It's a, kind of a, it's a few verses, but I want to read a story to you that Jesus told. It's, it's a parable. And, and this, is, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples. Do you guys know I hid a Bible back there? I'm not going to let load shedding get me. <laughs> so I want you to listen to this. So th this is uh, the parable of the unmerciful servant. So Peter comes to Jesus and he asks, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me up to seven times? So Peter's like, at what point can I stop forgiving somebody? At what point can I be bitter? At what point can I give somebody what they deserve? At what point, Jesus, can I stop being compassionate and kind? At what point can I just, can we just, you know, hammer people for what they need to be hammered for? And Jesus answers, he says, not seven times. I tell you, 77 times, or seven times 70. And Jesus is being like, no, exponentially more. It's basically, it's like he's talking to Peter the way I talked to Benjamin. It's like, no, you just will always forever do this. You will always forgive people. There is no limit. There's no end. There's no point where you can stop. And so Jesus decides, let me tell you a story. 
So he says in verse 23, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. So you've got a king, he's got servants, and he says, hey, pay up. Your money is due. And uh, as he began the settlement, a man who owned who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So here's the king, and he's saying, I want to settle all of my accounts. Time to bring them in. And so people are brought in. The king says, here's your bill, and people pay the money. This guy comes in. He can't afford it. So the king says, okay, we can solve that problem. I can sell you and everything that you have and get the money out of you. And so at, in verse 26, at this, at this fact, the servant who's been told, I'm going to sell you, your family, and everything you have to cover your debt. This servant fell on his knees before him. He said, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back. I will pay back everything that the servant's master took pity on him, and he canceled the debt and let him go. So the, the guy begs, begs for his life. And the servant's master doesn't just say, okay, I'll give you another 10 days, or I'll give you another month. It's not an extension on the loan. It's, he says, okay, your debt is just completely canceled. So then this servant, he walks out with a completely canceled debt. And he says, okay, in verse 28, But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. Sounds familiar, right? And then verse 30, the guy says he refused. Instead, he went off. He had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went and told their master everything that had happened. So the servant that received his debt canceled turns around and chokes and, and says, I'm going to get my money from you. And he turns around and does to somebody else what he begged his master not to do to him. So, fittingly, in verse 32, Then the master called the servant in. He said, You wicked servant, I canceled all the debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured. So it went from being sold to now he was going to be tortured, which... So there's a much worse punishment there. Until he should pay back what he owed. This is how the Heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So let me ask you this. Who's the hero in this story? See, the, the hero in this story is the, the, the gracious master that forgave the servant. He, he's the one that's the hero. Because he forgave the debt. If you put yourself in this story, you would say, obviously, the guy that gave me freedom, that's the hero. See, he, he let his servant live a debt-free life. And see, Jesus, he wants us to do the same thing. Jesus wants us to be the hero. He wants us to be the hero in our stories, in our story of bitterness. So the question that I would ask you is, do you want to live debt-free? Do you want to let others live debt-free? Do you want to live a life that, that keeps record of, of what everything wrong that everybody else does to you? Do, do you want to carry around your accounting book and add up everybody's debts and say, you know what, you've not done enough good to make up for what you did wrong because I still feel bitter and I'm still mad about it. See, it, Jesus is asking us to do something that's counterintuitive to us. We don't want to forgive we want to receive forgiveness, but it's a lot harder to forgive. It's super easy to receive forgiveness. It feels amazing when somebody forgives you. But then you turn around and you have to forgive somebody else. You know why that's harder? It's because it's more personal. Because now you've got to take the ownership of forgiving that person. And Jesus says that that's our, that's our role. That's our responsibility. And why would Jesus make it that way? Because I think it probably accounts for a better world and a better life. 
If we have less bitter people walking around, we have more happy people walking around. We have more forgiveness. We have more freedom. We have more people that aren't weighed down by bitterness or by anger or by hurt. And it, it doesn't make sense to our culture. See, everything about the life of Christ and the teachings of God's holy word is always counterintuitive to your human nature and the direction of culture. To everything that Jesus is telling us to do is just complete opposite of what social media and woke culture and the media and cancel culture and everything else is telling you to do. See, everywhere else out in the world is looking for a weakness in your chain, a chink in your armor. They're looking for a way to get in, and as soon as they get in and they expose just a little bit of weakness in you, they, they just want it. They teach you to exploit it, just rip it apart. Tell everybody in the world everybody's flaws. But Jesus says, no, do, do the opposite of that. Counsel their debt. Live debt free. Now, the third step to this, which is the hardest, is we're going to speak a blessing over the person that's made us so bitter. So we're going to expose it, tell somebody about it. We're going to cancel the debt, and then you're going to go a step further. And you're going to speak a blessing over that person or over that situation that's made you bitter. Now, just so you know that this is not just my idea, I want to show you again where this is in Scripture. In Luke 6, 27 through 8, it says, But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. So, wow, God, thank you for paving the way for an amazing life. This is just going to be so hard. And it is hard. What, see, we, we read this verse, but we don't really understand or apply it to our lives. Okay, so think about that person that you're bitter with right now. And you may have every right in the world by worldly standards to be bitter with them. Maybe it's somebody that abused you or somebody that hurt you or took advantage of you or a business partner that totally just messed you over with a deal. Maybe you've got the short end of the stick somewhere and you find yourself, okay, but, but God is saying to love that person. Love the person that you now feel bitter about. Do good to those who hate you. So they're hating you, but you're doing good to them. Bless those who curse you. You know, people that want the worst for you the people that try and steal from you, the people that try and take advantage of you. Jesus is saying, bless them and pray for those who mistreat you. See, why, why is this so hard for us? This is so hard for us because we like to do this thing where we compare sin. See, the word sin is actually, it's an archery term. And what it means is to miss the mark. Now, what is the mark? The mark that we're trying to hit as people is a mark of holiness. So if you think of a target, the center of that target, the mark, is God's holiness. And a good archer gets good because they can shoot an arrow and they can just hit, hit the bullseye every single time. But when you miss the mark, that's sin. God's holiness is our mark. Now, the reason that it's hard for us to speak a blessing on somebody that's hurt us is because we often think that, that we miss the mark by like millimeters and they miss the mark by a meter or by a kilometer or maybe they're just shooting the arrow in the opposite direction. They're not anywhere near it. But you know, here's the truth about missing the mark. Whether you miss the mark by this much or whether you miss the mark by this much, the same blood of Jesus had to cover you. The same grace from God had to take care of you. Whether it was this or whether it was this, what Jesus did is the same. Those of you that think you just missed the mark this much, Jesus died for you. And his death for you doesn't mean anything different than his death for somebody that's missed the mark this much or maybe even more. And so when we stop comparing sin then maybe it makes it a little bit easier to say, that person or that bitter situation that I'm holding on to in my heart, I'm going to let that go because you know what? I missed the mark. Jesus gave me grace. And so I want to make sure that I give grace. So Jesus gives us 
very simple instructions on how to live a bitter free life. And in John 15, 12 through 13, it says this, my commandment is this, love each other as I have loved you. Guess what? You missed the mark and Jesus loved you. So the ones that miss the mark with you, you are to love them. Love each other as I have loved you. It's not love each other as long as they do X, Y, and Z. No, it's just love each other as I have loved you. Remember, if we go back to the servant, the, the story of the master and the servant, see, Jesus as the master is canceling all of our debt. He's canceling every debt that everyone has. That's what he did when he died for us. Now, we don't want to turn around and walk out of here and go home or go to work or go into our, our family lives or our marriages, our relationships, and wring somebody's neck and say, give me what you owe me. You hurt me. I'm bitter at you. Give it to me. See, Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Don't, don't do that. Because I died for your sins and I've died for their sins. And you are to go and you are to love as I have loved you. And then he goes on in verse 13. Greater love has no one... Go back one more, Josh. Thanks. Greater love has, has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And now another verse, just to reinforce this in John. You did not choose me, but I chose you. This is Jesus talking. You were chosen by Jesus. And so you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Hey, there's that fruit thing. So that you would go bear fruit, meaning the roots that you're letting take root in your life are good. You're tending the garden of your soul so that you can go and you can bear fruit. Fruit that will last, fruit that will not go rotten. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my commandment, love each other. We are to love each other. So not only does Jesus give us a commandment to love each other, which is totally different from carrying and holding on to bitterness, he then gives the church a commandment as well. So Paul, writing in, in Ephesians, says this, in Ephesians 4, 31, get rid of all bitterness. This is Paul talking to you. This is Paul who, who, who had an amazing experience with Jesus, who ended up writing a good bit of the, of the New Testament. This is Paul. He's talking to you. He says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander. You know what else slander is? Gossip, talking bad about somebody behind their back. Along with every form of malice, that means bad intent. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Do you see the pattern there? Just as in Christ forgave you, we are to forgive others. And so I, I like to give you guys something to think about every week. We're, we're about to have an opportunity where we sing one more worship song. And during that opportunity, our, our prayer partners will come forward. And I just want you to know that, that we're here to pray with you. Uh, we're not here to solve your problems or, or anything, but we're just here to stand with you in prayer. But the thing that, that I want you to think about in this song, the thing I want you to, to, to really take to God here and kind of maybe challenge yourself about a little bit is this, is that, that you, whether you've accepted Jesus or not, you may be in this room and you don't have a relationship with Jesus. Whether you've accepted him or not, Jesus still died for you. His, his blood, his, his death, it was for you. So you were forgiven. Fact. Okay? All you have to do is accept it. It's a free gift. You accept it. It's like the master saying, okay, servant, I can cancel your debt. And the servant saying, no, I'd rather just carry it. It's okay. But, but that's what we do. So you accept the gift of grace from God, and then you turn around, and you pour that grace over your bitterness. And so what I'm going to ask you to do while we sing is I'm going to ask you to ask Jesus, because the power is not in you, it's in Jesus, to ask Jesus to pour that grace over your bitter heart. Lord Jesus, I just pray that you would show up in this room, that you would move throughout this room. I pray, Father, that, um, 
that anyone that's carrying any bitterness would just have it brought up. Maybe they're carrying bitterness they don't know about or they're unaware of. I pray, Father, that it would just come to light, that it would just be made known. Father, bring it out of the darkness, bring it into the light, put it on the tip of their tongues, put it in their mind, bring it up in their heart. And then, Lord Jesus, we desperately beg your grace to fall in this room, your grace to pour over every single heart. And I just pray, Father, that there is a glimmer of hope in every eye and every heart that there is freedom from the bitterness that we carry. We pray this trusting in your name, Jesus. Amen.